All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. When you subscribe, you're going to get all of our updates, including our sixth edition task list review. And we're in the process of completing that right now. We're also going to start a very new series very soon where we're going to go through these mini mocks by task list section. So a little more specific and a little more pointed. So if you have anything specific you want us to cover in those questions, make sure you comment below. As always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A consultant has developed a plan for a student who engages in shouting in class. The sp plan specifies that the teacher must ignore all instances of shouting. The consultant observes that the teacher is consistently reminding the student to be quiet when they shout. Why is this a problem for the consultant? All right, so we have a situation and you might find yourself in a similar situation where you're working with another professional, such as a teacher. And in this case, this consultant has a plan for shouting. The plan says ignore shouting while the teacher is actually telling the student to be quiet when they shout. So that's an issue for a few reasons. Most importantly, the teacher is not implementing the plan correctly. Now, we never wanna jump immediately to just saying, well, the teacher doesn't know what they're doing. We've got to ask ourselves, how's our training? Is there something in place for the teacher to do it correctly? Can we do a better job? So there's a couple different ways to approach the question of why is this a problem? So let's read A. A, the teacher's data will not be accurate. Remember, accuracy just means, are they measuring the true value? And if the teacher is measuring shouting, well, they can still measure an accurate amount of shouting regardless of the intervention. So A is not necessarily true. B, the teacher's intervention lacks procedural fidelity. Sure, there is not much fidelity here, given the fact that the plan says ignore shouting and the teacher is not ignoring it, but telling the student to be quiet. So B looks pretty good. C, because we read all of our answer choices, the student will fail to generalize to other classrooms. Well, are they generalizing shouting, not shouting? We're not sure. And additionally, the teacher not doing the intervention correctly isn't going to guarantee a lack of generalization. And then D, the goal lacks social significance. The goal hasn't changed. The issue is how the intervention is being implemented. So the real problem here is the lack of fidelity for this intervention. Just because the intervention is being done wrong doesn't mean these other things are necessarily true. The problem is the plan is not being followed. Joseph is asked to develop a program for an adult client who lives in a group home. Joseph observes two behaviors. The client taps their fingers on the table for long periods of time, and the client does not make eye contact or respond when spoken to. Joseph should prioritize prioritize working on which behavior and why. Now, as a, an analyst, a lot of times you're going to have to choose between several different behaviors. We only have enough time in the day to target certain things. So we need to make sure what we're targeting is going to make meaningful contributions to the client's life and those around them. In Joseph, Joseph's case, we have an adult who taps their fingers on the table for a long time and they don't make eye contact or respond when spoken to. Now immediately, what do we think Joseph should prioritize working on for an adult? Well, likely the idea that they're not responding when spoken to. Maybe the eye contact isn't that big of an issue, but not responding when spoken to as an adult is going to cause problems. Whereas tapping their fingers on the table for long periods of time can mean a bunch of different things, and that's not necessarily that abnormal. Now, if we look at A, Joseph should prioritize the finger tapping because it is an obvious and unusual behavior. Now, just because a behavior is obvious, remember, a behavior is anything an organism does. So most behaviors are going to be obvious. And this idea that the behavior is unusual or you sometimes will hear annoying does not constitute or justify targeting that behavior. Does that behavior change really have meaning? Is it valid? That's what we have to ask ourselves. B, the finger tapping because it is a self-stimulatory behavior. 
Just because something's self-stimulatory doesn't mean we have to target it. If the client tapped their pencil, that would be self-stimulatory, but not responding when spoken to still seems more valid. See the lack of eye contact and response because it will likely lead to more meaningful interactions. That's true. Not responding when spoken to as an adult and even as a younger child is going to cause problems. It's going to be much more pressing than tapping their fingers on the table for long periods of time. D, the lack of eye contact and response because it is an easy skill to teach. Well, we don't know that for sure and we don't target something just because it's easy. Now, another takeaway from this is you can only use the information given to us, right? So we don't know a lot about the client, their history, the finger tapping. All we know is they're an adult. They have two behaviors. They tap their fingers and then they don't respond when spoken to. Based on the information, which we can only use the information given, not responding when spoken to is going to be more important than tapping their fingers. A consultant tells a child, when you finish your homework, you can watch a movie. The child immediately sits down and finishes their homework. This is an example of a behavior being controlled by what? All right, pretty straightforward question. This behavior is being controlled by what? The behavior is child sitting down and finishing their homework. What caused it? Well, the consultant said, when you finish your homework, you can watch a movie. So this consultant has established this rule. That rule is the verbal statement, right? It's a verbal contingency, more or less, where we're stating what needs to be done and the consequence for that action. And the rule is a rule because the contingency hasn't been realized yet, and yet the behavior still changes. So the child hasn't watched the movie yet, and yet they sit down and finish their homework immediately because of the rule established by that consultant. We don't know if it's a punisher or reinforcer yet because we don't know how that movie, watching a movie, is going to change the behavior. And it isn't a prompt because the consultant, this is the SD, and the client immediately sits down, right? We have an antecedent behavior, and then whether it's a punisher or reinforcer remains to be seen. The rule states the behavior, states what's going to happen if you engage in the behavior, and then leads to behavior change without yet contacting the contingency. The behavior is controlled by a rule. You arrive at a client's home alongside your behavior technician and realize the reinforcers used in yesterday's sessions, snacks and stickers are unavailable. The parent suggests just use a TV remote as a reinforcer, even though you don't know whether the client values it. What should you do first? So we want to involve parents and it's great that the parents are giving you suggestions, but we don't just blindly jump into these suggestions, right? Always, always, always for new behaviors, new preferences, new reinforcers, we've got to assess, okay? So if you show up and you have a client who is missing reinforcement or reinforcers such as snacks and stickers, well, what we need to do is at least try to do some sort of preference assessment, right? So just because the parents have just used a TV remote, even though you don't know whether the client values it, you don't want to just jump in and use that remote. One, they may not value it. Two, it may lead to more issues than you had before. So before we do anything else, what do we do first? A, begin the session and try using the TV remote as reinforcement. Well, even before then, before going down that path, how about we do a quick assessment? And we can do these brief assessments. B, cancel session until preferred reinforcers are obtained. We can't do that some days reinforcement can be a struggle for some of our clients. We can't just not have session. C, conduct a quick preference check to see if the remote is preferred by the client. Sure, it takes five, 10 minutes. Do they like the remote? Can we do a full reinforcer assessment? Maybe not, but at least a preference check is going to help us roll out or roll in this TV remote on some level. And then D, substitute reinforcement with verbal praise only. You could, but it's not going to be what you should do first because we have the suggestion of the TV remote. Before we do anything else, we're going to conduct this pre preference check to see if the remote is preferred by the client. The client receives a piece of their favorite candy after completing every math problem. After 15 minutes, the client stops working, pushes away the worksheet, and refuses to take or eat any more candy. What most likely explains the decrease 
and responding. So let's think about this, right? We have a client who's receiving a piece of their candy after every math problem. And this is how we're approaching these questions, right? We're not jumping to the answer choices. We're breaking these down. Let's gather information. If they're getting candy after every math problem, well, that looks like an FR1, right? Or a continuous schedule. Now, after 15 minutes of this, they don't work. They push away the worksheet and they don't take or eat any more candy. Why might that be? Well, if we look at A, reinforcer satiation, that's probably a likely culprit. They've been working for 15 minutes on an FR1 schedule. It's a lot of problems, or assumingly a lot of problems or a long time to work. And if they're not taking the candy anymore and not working anymore, and then they likely satiated on that candy. Uh, is there a better answer? B, resurgence. Well, resurgence has to do with extinction, and we're not looking at extinction here. C, extinction burst, same as B. We can rule that out. We're not discussing extinction. And then D, reactivity. Reactivity occurs when? When behavior changes in the presence of a present stimulus, typically a person observing. Not the case here. So even if reinforcer satiation wasn't true, which it looks like it might be, it's still our best answer out of all four. And sometimes that's what we have to go with, our best answer. So what most likely explains a decrease well, out of our answer choices? A, reinforcer satiation. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.